Here we go. Welcome everybody. Um, tonight's presentation is a joint presentation of the City Branch of the Wildlife Trust and the Herefordshire Green Network. So we're really pleased to be collaborating with the Green Network tonight. And in a few minutes, I will hand over to Wendy Ogden from the Herefordshire Green Network. Brilliant. Thank you very much. So the Herefordshire Green Network, um, we're a not-for-profit organisation and we bring together uh, local groups and individuals who are committed to a thriving Herefordshire uh, and working together uh, particularly to address the climate and ecological crises. Um, it, we've been um, in working at a grassroots level in the county for over 10 years. Um, we've got community organisations, businesses, parish councils, charities and individuals um, who join with our activities and um, in the last year or so we've been involved with the Climate and Ecological Emergency Steering Group working with Herefordshire Council um, towards their um, 2030 Climate Zero, Cl Zero Carbon Action Plan which is going to be announced quite soon. Uh, we connect uh, local people and individuals um, and have projects, um, repair cafes and the great collaboration which I'll talk about shortly and we have lots of free events. Uh, recent ones have been about sustainable food and transport and building retrofits and community hubs um, and we have a free weekly newsletter that goes out um, to over 400 people and then out to our groups of about 35,000 people across Herefordshire. And we've had a huge increase in numbers in the last year, which is great. Um, our, our, one of our flagship projects is the Great Collaboration, where we are working specifically with parish councils and their communities. Um, and we have um, dealt with about 41% of the councils and over 155 councillors um, in the last 18 months or so, which is really great. Um, and just a quick sneak preview of our new, uh, oh, we're really excited about our new platform, a parish portal which is going to be a, a website where people can click um, what carbon reduction actions they're interested in um, and that will give information to the parish councils about um, areas of interest and what help people need. Um, so that was just a very quick run through. Um, more details on our website hgnetwork.org. Um, I'm Wendy Ogden um, and you can email me on admin at hgnetwork.org. Um, we're well, yeah, delighted to be here with um, with the Wildlife Trust tonight. Um, really interested to hear how we can support the 30 by 30 campaign and particularly interested in nature recovery networks. Uh, their importance for biodiversity loss, climate change and well-being. Um, these are really interconnected issues and loads of co-benefits with them um, with what they can deliver. So um, it really underlines the importance of nature in everything that we do. So it's great that we're collaborating in this way. So that's all from me, just a quick hello. Um, and I'll pass on now to, um, stop sharing, pass on now to Andrew and look forward to hearing more about all those issues. Great, okay, thank you, Wendy and thanks, Anne. And uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome. It's great that so many people have uh, joined in this evening. I'm gonna do the same. I'm gonna share my screen and hopefully this will all work swimmingly. Uh, so you, hopefully you can all see that now, can you? Is that coming up? Yeah. Yep, yeah, we can see it, Andrew. Nods there. Okay. Come on. Ah, there we are. Yeah, Great. Right. Okay. Right. Uh, just a little bit quickly about ourselves. Um, uh, yeah, we are your local wildlife trust, Herefordshire Wildlife Trust. Um, we are an independent, uh, you know, we are a, an organisation, a charity um, in our own right, but we are in, in effect part of a federation of 46 wildlife trusts across uh, the UK. Um, and so, you know, collaboratively, we are quite a strong um, force of nature. Um, we work at the county level to manage nature reserves. We've got 55 reserves. Uh, with well over a thousand acres of land. We're advocates for wildlife, so we try to make sure that we're at the table whenever wildlife um, issues are being discussed or, or wildlife might be threatened to make sure that nature is properly represented. Um, we create and deliver on living landscapes, um, which is about ecological connectivity. So that's one of the, you know, the key things that I'm going to be talking about uh, tonight. 
Um, and then finally, and very importantly, we engage with people as well. We have a, a, an excellent engagement team and we work with communities, landowners, families, thousands of school children every year. So it's, that's a, a, a huge part of, um, uh, of our work. Uh, and we're supported by more than 5,000 members. I think it's probably close to getting on to five and a half thousand now um, and more than 300 volunteers. I think those numbers are a little bit out of date. Um, so uh, volunteers are a key part of our work and deliver huge amounts of the activity that the Wildlife Trust uh, manages to over undertake over the course of the year. Um, and that's our vision, uh, create a Herefordshire richer and more diverse in wildlife, bringing its people closer to nature. And then we have a separate mission which uh, effectively underpins um, that vision. So that's a little bit about us. Um, and I just wanted, I was going to start by setting the, the context a little bit of, about why why we've got to this stage and, and um, you know, the, the, the processes that have led to a, you know, a discussion about nature recovery networks and why why they're needed and what, you know, how they've evolved. So um, a lot has happened uh, over the last few years. And when I think about my time with Herefordshire Wildlife Trust, I started with the trust coming up to nearly five years ago now. And the world seems to be a completely different place since you know, since I started. The, we, we, we hadn't even had the Brexit vote when I joined the Trust and you know that's happened and we've left. We've had this acknowledgement of climate and ecological emergencies you know, at local, national and international scales and uh, organisations like Extinction Rebellion have brought you know things like the climate crisis into sharp focus. Um, we've had you know COVID-19 and the coronavirus and uh, you know I think the impacts of that in, turn, in terms of the um, uh, the natural world. I think people have really, in some cases for the first time, really engaged and experienced wildlife and had that sort of time um, and that quietness to sort of, um, to engage with nature and reap the benefits of that. And I think we've, we've sort of now all respect our um, green infrastructure and our green spaces far more than we did two years ago as a consequence of that. And I think there's a strong desire not to return back to normal um, because of it. Um, and then again, <clears throat> another sort of local, national and an international impact of these uh, issues around flooding and drought. Uh, and you know, in Hereford, we've seen two, I think the worst three floods ever recorded in the last 13, 14 months, um, and somehow managed to fit a drought in in between those as well. So. You know, these are these are the impacts that we're seeing now, um, and it's affecting us at a very local level. Things have moved very rapidly, and the wildlife trusts have been um, obviously looking at this and trying to um, consider what needs to, uh, you know, our role within it um, and the challenges that it, it's going to present. Um, and collectively, we perceive that there are three crises at the moment. There's the climate crisis. And the need to achieve net carbon neutrality by 2050 or sooner. And of course, most of us are working on a much more ambitious target than that. And in Herefordshire, we're talking about 2030. We've got the ecological crisis and the need to reverse the decline of nature. Um, and that, that critical word there is reverse. You know, we're talking about reversing and restoring and restoration of wildlife now. We are, things have gone too far and we need to take things much further back. Um, and that disconnect crisis as well and you know linking back to you know the, what I've just said about coronavirus and, and uh, what Wendy picked up on as well um, so you know these are the three sort of the three um, main priorities that we think that we need to work on and behind that all of that is this concept of bringing wildlife back and the role that has in um, helping resolve some of these crises uh, so the trust nationally are now looking at this uh, what we call a strategic triangle um, uh, where we have this ecological crisis, climate crisis and health disconnect crisis, and we have targets uh, associated with that. And again, as Wendy says, we, you know, these, these things are not to be considered in isolation. So um, the, you know, I'm going to be talking predominantly about the ecological crisis tonight and nature recovery networks and connectivity, but really, you know, the, the health of that relies very much on the health of these two aspects as well. They're very much interconnected. I'll touch on that a little bit as I go through. 
Um, so I just wanted to sort of like set the political and historical context a little bit as to why we're talking. There's a lot of talk about nature recovery networks at the moment. Um, and that, that's principally because they, you know, they are now feature quite prominently in some um, important statutory documents and legislation that's um, passing at the moment. Nature recovery networks feature in the uh, uh, DEFRA's 25 year plan. The Wildlife Trust were uh, pushed very strongly for it uh, for them to be included in that. So obviously we're very pleased that that has come about. Um, and then we have the Environment Bill that's slowly working its way through Parliament. I think it's been delayed now and postponed until the end of, so I think it might be as late as October. And I think it was supposed to have been passed uh, October of last year. So it's, it's, it's had various delays and obviously the government has had other things on its mind as well. Um, but that, you know, that's clearly a frustration for us. But clearly um, this is a, you know, a key part of this is um, nature recovery networks or more specifically within the bill, it talks about local nature recovery strategies. Uh, and what uh, it's going to mandate is that all counties within England produce a local nature recovery strategy. And as part of that strategy, there will be a requirement to uh, produce a local nature recovery map. Uh, and the idea being that as these maps are produced across the county, uh, for each county, they will come together and form a uh, nature recovery network map for the whole of England. Um, so, you know, the, uh, two very important um, pieces of legislation. Um, yeah, so um, moving on. Uh, there's a lot of talk about it at the moment, but this this um, uh, sort of um, idea of ecological connectivity uh, stretches way back beyond, you know, before um, nature recovery networks and the current bills. And so if we go back, sort of back to 2010, we had the Making Space for Nature report uh, prepared by Professor Lawton. Uh, and within that were these Lawton principles. And I'm sure many of you have heard these before and seen the diagram like this before, uh, but it's it, it's centered around the, the principles of more, bigger, better, and joined or better connect is how it's often uh, described. And these have sort of like stayed with us and withstood the test of time. And I would say that most nature conservations uh, organizations are still using uh, those principles in their work in terms of landscape connectivity. Um, the other thing I, I didn't mention about the Environment Bill is that uh, it's the first piece of legislation that looks at restoration. This is nature recovery networks. So we are looking at restoring nature. In the past, all pieces of legislation were just looking at halting the decline. Uh, so that's quite actually a significant change um, from what's gone before. Now, now that said, that what's gone before is actually you know, that failed to halt the decline of biodiversity. And so this has got to do an awful lot if it's going to actually succeed in doing that and reverse decline and see restoration of nature as well. Um, but it is, you know, a step change effectively in terms of um, um, the, the level of ambition um, for, for nature in the UK. So, you know, these principles around ecological connectivity um, go back and you know, on this particular diagram you can see here uh, you know you've got these these what are considered core patches of, of habitat um, and essentially what you're trying to do is extend on these create buffers make them bigger you want more of them um, and you also want to make them connected and you know you there are two sort of main ways of or, or yeah, two, two ways of the, that connectivity can be achieved. You have what's called physical connectivity, uh, where you have a, a, a linear corridor feature that connects two habitats together. So and a simple example would be two ancient woodlands. You plant a hedgerow between, between the two. Uh, and in theory, a dormouse then can run along that hedgerow and move from one habitat patch to another. Um, in an uninterrupted way. So there's a physical connection there. Um, the other form of connectivity is known as functional connectivity, whereby it isn't a physical corridor, but you're creating sort of stepping stones, patches of habitat within the countryside, so this particular area here, um, 
that allows that creates stepping stones effectively for species to sort of hop, find refuge, and get from one location to another. Now that obviously relies on the species ability to uh, disperse, um, and some species, of course, can quite readily move from patch to patch. Uh, you know, mobile species such as birds and butterflies, for example, might be able to do that. Um, other species are going to struggle. Um, but essentially, the, the, you know, the concept is that if you have enough of these patches in the landscape, you create connectivity and species can, can diffuse and well, permeability, it's often referred to, species can move through that landscape. And really what you want is a combination of these two uh, approaches. But even Professor Lawton wasn't the first. The Wildlife Trusts came up with their living landscapes concepts back in 2007. So this was looking at outside of the nature reserve approach and saying, you know, we need to work on a landscape scale. And most trusts just, you know, designated or devised areas that were their living landscape areas. And within Herefordshire, we have seven. So these have been selected according to certain criteria. And I think for those people that know the habitats of Herefordshire relatively well, will, you know, I, you know, see that these are areas where, you know, we get our greatest concentration of habitats and you know, rarer species occurring. And it isn't just living landscapes aren't just about landscape connectivity either. It's about those social aspects. Um, it's about working with communities. It's about working with landowners. Uh, uh, and so it, it, it's bringing in, in those other uh, components. And then if you want to go back even further, uh, back in the year sort of 1999, 2000, um, Herefordshire was hosting a project called the Woolhope Dome Project that's ran for about seven years, I think it was. Uh, and it was it was running when I when I first returned to Herefordshire in about 2001. Um, and I thought at the time, well, that's, you know, that's an interesting project because it was, again, looking at uh, these um, connectivity of biodiversity hotspots within the landscape, working with landowners to improve the, that connectivity, trying to get things like machinery rings and flying flocks of sheep to gray sites, but also again, looking at those social aspects. Uh, so I think things like the um, Woolhope Farmers Market emerged out of that. Uh, and so, you know, it was looking at that wider context. So you know, there was some quite pioneering work in landscape connectivity going on um, in Herefordshire. 20 years ago. Um, so, you know, what is the, um, uh, you know, the role of nature reserves within this, and what, you know, why do we need ecological connectivity? Um, if you think back to sort of like the history of where nature reserves came from, uh, you know, the wildlife trusts sort of first started emerging sort of 60, 70 years ago. We're coming up to our 60th anniversary, um, and it was that the landscapes were going through a dramatic change at that time. We'd seen that push for production during World War II, and that continued really um, in the subsequent years. Um, and you know, that's when we've started losing tremendous amounts of our wildlife habitats. And the, the, we often quote a statistic of 97% uh, loss of species-rich grasslands or wildflower meadows. Um, and you know that was happening at that time. You know this is, is this is when that sort of transformation was was happening, and it was being recognised. And so you know, designated you know, nature reserves were starting to be uh, increasingly designated around that time, and have continued to be so uh, ever since. And the 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 management of these sites um, is a, about using traditional management. So it's it's haymaking and it's coppicing. Um, and of course, when we were Back in the 1960s, when we were first designating some of our sites, uh, you know those those practices were still more commonplace, uh, and were certainly within you know you know recent memory of, of having been used in, in a quite wide widespread way. Um, and of course, over time, what's happened? Um, nature reserves were always intended to be sort of effectively arc sites where our wildlife could take refuge. The idea being that once the landscape around them became more friendly, that species could then disperse and recover into that landscape. But time has gone on and on, and that just hasn't happened. And in fact, what's happened is the landscape around these nature reserves has become increasingly hostile in the whole. And, and so 
you know, when visiting nature reserves now, it almost feels like you're going to visit a museum and, and seeing you know, traditional management techniques um, and the species within them are almost like artifacts, basically, like as if you were going to see something in a museum. And that's really not what it's supposed to be. Um, and you know, when we when we you know when you talk about you know something like a vase in a museum, you can keep that in perfect condition forever if you have the right environment. But on nature reserves, it doesn't work that way. And even though we manage them to the best of our ability, you know, we still have losses of wildlife in them because of pressures from the surrounding environment. Um, so, you know, nature reserves don't work in the in themselves um, in terms of you know. The, the future for wildlife and we're still getting extinctions. And so connectivity is hugely important in this because a lot of the reasons for these losses are because of a lack of connectivity in the landscape. We're not getting those genetic diversity within our uh, uh, populations there. Um, we're not getting that mixing of um, animals uh, to shake up and, and mix up that gene pool. Uh, and then you can have things like uh, local extinction events, so if, you know, for example, a pond gets polluted and it kills all of the amphibians in that pond, the only way those amphibians can repopulate it is if there's another pond nearby. Um, and if there isn't, um, they, never, they never will get back to it. So, you know, as things become more fragmented, we're getting these sort of extinctions and no way um, or no means by which we can um, repopulate these, a lot of these sites. So you've got all, all of those pressures on the, on the nature reserves. Um, uh, and you know connectivity is important, and then we've also now got the the, the spectre of climate change. It's not so much of a spectre; it's already influencing um, wildlife in this country quite significantly. And they say that species have their own climatic envelope, the you know, the, the 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 climate that they like to live within. Uh, and with every one degree of change that we get as our world warms, is effectively the same as having to travel 400 kilometres north. For a species to stay inside its climatic envelope and we're already beyond that one degree. Um, so uh, you know again for some species that might not be a problem. For some birds they might be able to make that that trip over many years to stay to do that. But you can imagine for sort of you know a, a slug that likes ancient woodland for example, a lemon slug or something like that which you know 400 kilometers is a significant undertaking, even in a, you know, a, a very well connected landscape. So, you know, the, your species are going, some species are really going to struggle. Now, other, you know, it doesn't have to necessarily be north. Species might be able to travel in altitude. They might be able to get to higher altitudes to stay within their, the climate that they like, or they might be able to move to different aspects. But what it requires is the species to be able to move. And species can only move through the landscape if they've got the habitat. That they need to move through. So you know, it's absolutely crucial in, that now that connectivity is achieved uh, to ensure the future of our wildlife. Uh, and this is you know, this is filtered through to the way that we operate now. We've we've changed our uh, our acquisitions uh, criteria. In the past, we would always select sites that already had good biodiversity value. You know, we would look at those and we would want to preserve them, you know, from any future threats by taking ownership of them and looking after them. That's still, of course, extremely important, but actually we've broadened out now and we're looking at other land which may not have at the moment inherent good biodiversity value, uh, but which can play a strategic part in connecting landscapes together. And that's, shown in our most recent acquisition of Oak Tree Farm, um, which is situated between Bodenham Lake Nature Reserve and Wellington Gravel Pit. We want to create wetland on this uh, particular site uh, and that will act as a stepping stone within our lug living landscape. Uh, and also when we're looking at acquiring sites, we also look at their proximity to other nature reserves that we own or other biodiversity rich sites. So those sites which are adjoining um, existing reserves have greater value because we go back to those Lawton principles of bigger and better and better connected. We're actually creating buffers and more habitat and making these uh, sites bigger. So it's influencing the way that we um, acquire land. Uh, so, you know, what makes nature recovery networks different? I've, you know, I've, I've talked about, um, you know, th there's, this, there's this history of connectivity 
um, uh, concepts and activity. What makes Nature Recovery Networks different? Well, first of all, th this is the first time that it's really been adopted nationally. Um, so that, we, as I say, every county is going to have one of these and we are going to have a Nature Recovery Network map for the whole of England. And importantly, we're going to have the consistency of format. They're still working on the methodologies and the processes for creating these local nature recovery strategies uh, and the, uh, the methodology for some of this mapping work for nature recovery network maps. Um, and also importantly, they, they're working on um, the, the funding sources to support delivery, and that's never been there uh, before. So they, they, they differ in two sort of fundamental ways there. Um, and you know, in terms of how they're going to be used, um, well, they're, they're going to be used to inform the planning system. Uh, so you know, how we can, you know, selecting sites for development, um, selecting sites for biodiversity net gain, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a moment. Uh, so you know, it's talking about integrating it into other uh, statutory um, undertakings. So it'll also be um, a target for environmental land management schemes which we uh, know are on the horizon coming in in 2024. So it can be very important within that. Um, it can inform what sort of landscape projects that we might be working on with other organizations in partnership to deliver nature conservation. It, you know, it will deliver evidence of need and help direct the activity that we want to undertake. Um, it will inform some of the activities of others and things that we want to do as well so you know there's a lot of interest in tree planting at the moment you know it's 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 good to plant trees we you know we would like to see twice the amount of woodland cover uh, that we have uh, within Hereford or twice the tree cover um, but we have to plant trees in the right place uh, and so you know it will you know these these strategies and maps um, will help prevent us planting them in the wrong places such as on other very important habitats that we might have. Uh, it will provide some of the information for natural capital mapping because you know there's a lot of uh, interest in mapping our natural capital as well and the two are so closely interlinked so we you when, you, when, you, when you're looking at natural capital you're, you're talking about things like natural flood management where is our water storage where is our peat stored where are our carbon stores uh, and really the two should be going in hand in hand so that when we're creating biodiversity evidence we're in, you know, we're in creating natural capital assets at the same time uh, and vice versa. And then importantly, these local nature recovery uh, strategies will give us as local organizations and, and all, you know, individuals uh, the opportunity in um, developing a vision for uh, our local environment in the county. Um, so how do we um, start, you know, developing our, our nature recovery network. Um, now effectively we need to know our starting point really because you, you know we need to know what the current picture is to be able to determine what we want to be able to do and a big part of that is understanding the habitats and species that we want to protect. So I think in Herefordshire we've done quite a lot of work on this in terms of identifying what's important in the county uh, and we've produced the biodiversity action plan as a county um, and we're, we're actually one of the very few counties that have continued um, to support the biodiversity action plan and, and, and update it. I think it's due, just due to update again this year in, a, in effect. But that biodiversity action plan um, identifies our main habitat types and the threats to them, the current actions that are being undertaken and what we need to do, our objectives and actions around um, each of the various habitats. And it's not just the habitats, it's um, species as well. So. Um, we, we've identified those key species that we need to um, conserve within the county. And again, the objectives and the actions that we need to undertake uh, to uh, deliver that. So this, this is obviously a black poplar is uh, an example of that. Um, so, you know, we, we have an idea of those um, habitats and this is the full list that we've got there within our biodiversity action plan. Um, you, you can see uh, those biodiversity action plans, they're, they're, they're available for viewing on Herefordshire Wildlife Link uh, website. Um, uh, and so, you know, we, 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 there's been a lot of thought um, and a lot of understanding about um, what we need to conserve. Um, the next part though is where are the habitats 
threatened species that we want to protect. And on this, um, certainly on the habitat side of things, we um, we are not so up to date on where we need to be. Um, so there are you know various data sources out there, um, and various surveys are being undertaken across the county, and there's a lot of hard work being put in by lots of surveyors and specialists and organisations uh, to get as much information together as possible. Uh, and I think you could go to any county in the country and they would all say that they need to have a better handle on uh, their habitat information within their county. Um, uh, uh, but, I, you know, I think we, we are sort of perhaps a little bit behind uh, most counties. And that's you know, part of the nature of Herefordshire, really. It's a big county, a low population. Um, so, you know, the resources aren't there to do the amount of uh, survey work that we would uh, we'd like. But nevertheless, we, you know, I, I must underplay the fact that we there is a lot of information out there um, that has been uh, compiled over a number of years. Um, and, you know, there, there, there's this list of data sets. Again, this data relies in some instances on quite old information uh, and the, the countryside is a dynamic place. You know, meadows are created and meadows are lost and ponds are filled in. So um you know up to date data is uh, is is extremely important um nevertheless we are um actually uh right now looking at developing a, our first nature recovery network map for the county um and we're working quite closely with Gloucestershire Wildlife Trust on this we're working with Gloucestershire Wildlife Trust uh, for a number of reasons they've they've actually been developing the methodology on this and looking at this for for a like two and two and a half years now, I think, something like that. Uh, and they've actually been, they've done their work within Gloucestershire and they've actually been supporting quite a number of other counties throughout the country. They also uh, border us as well. So, you know, we can be sure of consistency of uh, methodology across that boundary. Um, they might be working with other uh, bordering counties as well. Um, and they're also delivering it for our two county protected landscape. So, we're, you know, effectively we're all, working to the, the same um, system um, and so this mapping work at the moment includes partners such as Natural England who are, who are funding it um, and the AOMBs and the Heritage Council and, and ourselves. So um, and, and effectively the way this is working I'm going to go through a, a, a few slides and I'm going to get a bit technical now for a while there's going to be a few technical slides coming up for four or five but I think it's useful to go through it just to explain the sort of the, the um, the various thought processes that need to go in to creating nature recovery network maps because um, it, it, you know, there are a number of things that you really do need to um, consider when doing this um, and it, the approach that we're taking is um, that the process have developed is they've, they're looking at ecological connectivity permeability and to do that they've they're working with four networks it's impossible to try it gets impossibly confusing to try and break it down into a long string of individual habitats. So you're looking at open habitats, wooded habitats, water and wetlands, arable, and then we've got some species data to um, include as well. And also because it's particularly important in Herefordshire, we're looking at traditional orchards um, as a layer as well, because traditional orchards is an interesting way it kind of feeds into wooded habitats and open habitats as well. So, um, so we have these four networks of, of habitats uh, that we're focusing in on. Um, and the way that um, it, it's being approached is, of course, I mentioned before about some species are able to disperse further than others. And, and so when we're looking at how well connected our landscape is, how easy is it for species to move from one um, area of habitat to another? That varies um, enormously depending on the species, but it also varies considerably about the habitat that's in between those two patches. So if you take, for example, a butterfly and it's on a, um, a nice species rich um, grassland, um, and that might be ha quite happy to travel up to 500 meters if the surrounding landscape isn't too intimidating for it, um, you, know, it, 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 you know, it could travel that distance. But if that wildflower meadow is surrounded by development uh, and it's housing and hard sealed surfaces and a business park and things like that it's not likely to travel anything like as far um, it's going to it's not going to want to travel those sorts of distances so 
you have this sort of dispersal distance divided by ecological cost. And the ecological cost is how difficult it is for a species to travel through that habitat. Um, and so if it's a, in this instance, a low cost habitat, um, it's quite happy to travel its 500 meters. If it's a high cost habitat, it might only travel 10 meters, for example. So you know, these are all the sorts of things that we need to consider when we're creating uh, nature recovery network maps. And just to help you sort of visualize that a bit more, if we look at this, these are, say these are um, our species rich meadows again, taken from a map. Um, they're all these sort of, they can see them as different island patches. If our butterfly wants to travel 500 meters, you can draw a line around 500, you know, a line around all of those 500 meters out, you get a picture like that. And it shows you how far those butterflies will travel. Um, and you can see that, you know, in this instance, you know, in theory, it should be able to travel from one area to another without um, too much difficulty. But once that surrounding habitat has been assessed as to how hostile or, or friendly it is to that species moving, uh, you get gaps. And in fact, they're only likely to, that butterfly is only likely to travel in this instance as far as these purple areas go. So it's much more restricted because the habitat in between is not suitable. Now that habitat in between might not be suitable because it's uh, buildings and road surfaces. It could be another habitat. It could be that we have a nice ancient woodland between those two sites and that will be a barrier to it. So all of those things need to uh, factor in. And of course, you know, I said, I've used 500 meters as an example, which, but you know, different species travel dis different distances. And so you can model differently for each species and that there's three different shades of purple there 500 uh, for a species that might be traveling five to 500 meters thousand meters or five thousand meters um so that's you know by doing that exercise i mean that that's just shows an example for um open habitats but you'd have to repeat that again for woodlands and wetlands and arable um, habitats um and you know then you would you know you'd look to um, compare each of those. Uh, so that shows you how well connected your landscape is. But when you're talking about a nature recovery network map, you know, you want to restore connectivity or make it, you know, improve that connectivity within the landscape. Now those, those connectivity maps are good. They will show you that uh, actually if you, if you just planted a, you know, or well not planted trees, but created a new meadow in a certain area, it might just close a very narrow gap. But there are also a whole host of other things that we need to consider. Um, so you know, things such as is the land of low agricultural uh, value? Um, has it had low inputs for a long time? If it has, you're much more likely to get a successful meadow on that site. What's the soil type like, the hydrology like? You know, are there heritage sites there? Um, that's another opportunity and or a constraint if you've got you know, a field that you would be perfect for planting trees on because it would connect two woodlands, um, but it has a scheduled ancient monument buried under its surface. You're going to, you know, th that's going to be a constraint. It's going, you're going to struggle. And for that reason, it will score lower. And also you, you, land ownership might be a key factor in this. If it's a, already owned by an organization that really would like to create habitats, then you know you're much more likely to be able to achieve um, and then there are also constraints. And as I said before, the constraints can be things like other priority habitats. You do not, I gave the example of planting, you know, woodland on meadow sites. You, if you've got two species rich grasslands or two woodlands and they're separated by species rich grassland, you don't want to plant woodland on that. Uh, so, um, you know, you need to avoid other priority habitats. You don't want to destroy one to create another. Um, and then landscape character is important in certain areas and certainly within protected landscapes whereby you know, you know, large scale tree planting, for example, might not be as favorable as species rich grassland because it fits with the landscape character. Um, so then, you know, going back to our map, um, you can then look at the opportunities for creating new habitats and where, where are the priorities for creating new habitats? And in this instance, the darker shades of purple uh, are the areas which uh, uh, you, know, you would want to create grassland on, and as they get progressively lighter to a white color, um, less so, because um, you can score against all of these 
various factors. And you'll notice that the darker purples tend to be closer to your core habitat areas because um, of those concepts again around bigger, better and better connected. You want to extend and buffer existing sites first. Um, if you bring all of those different opportunity areas together, that effectively is what starts creating your nature recovery network map. Um, and interestingly, um, the, the, the wetland uh, opportunities are shown as a transparent layer because the wetland opportunities don't just take into consideration habitat, they also take into consideration hydrology and topography. Um, so if a site is suitable for wetland creation, it overlays what might that you know might be a priority habitat. So you might want to create wet grassland or, or wet heath or wet woodland. So it's uh, treated in a slightly different way. Um, and it, that complex uh, a diagram just kind of essentially summarizes that process. But if you go from left to right, it's looking at you need to have that complete cover habitat map and that have robust data to support that to start with. You go through that process of identifying what the current connectivity is within the landscape. And from that, you start looking at your opportunity mapping, and that will create your nature recovery network map um, for future delivery. Um, but it all hinges on, you know, that quality of that data to start with. And I think also the other thing to point out is that, you know, these are useful tools and a useful guide. Um, but ultimately, nothing replaces actually getting out on the land and having a look at that land to ensure that it's suitable. And you might want to do things like soil testing and all sorts of things. So, you know, that that um, on the ground surveys is hugely important. Um, and I, I should mention, you know, we we there's nature recovery network mapping, but there's a lot of interest at the moment and a lot of work going on around the country for natural capital mapping. So this is all about those, you know, uh, natural flood management and carbon sequestration. And that needs to be brought into the mix as well. Uh, and so that what we want to do is make sure that nature recovery network maps influence the natural capital maps and vice versa as well. So that when we're delivering natural flood management, be it through planting trees or creating meadows, you know, we're doing it so where it, it has these multiple benefits that biodiversity and habitats are a key delivery of uh, um, natural processes and natural capital. So um, thank you for bearing with, with, your, uh, with those technical slides, uh, but I thought it was important to show that the, that the, you know, the, the level of thought process um, that needs to go in when you're, when you're considering uh, creating a nature recovery network map. Um, and this, these methodologies are still being developed. Um, uh, so you know, what Gloucestershire have done has been used by many counties and they form part of the sort of the national steering group that's, that's looking at this um, across the country. Um, so that, that you know, you, if you get your nature recovery network map, that shows you where you want to um, create habitats, but it doesn't tell us the amount of habitat that we need. Um, and that's where the 3030 campaign comes in, because uh, nationally, the Wildlife Trust believe that you need 30% of land managed for wildlife to restore nature. and uh, our target is for, to, to get that in place by 2030. Um, it's gained a lot of traction. Um, Boris Johnson used it in one of his speeches recently, although we might debate with him about what you consider land that's being managed for wildlife. I think we've got some differences there. Um, but uh, it's, it's, it's gaining traction, not just in the UK, but internationally as well. It tends to be a, a, a sort of an accepted uh, uh, a target. Uh, so this campaign for nature that I've got up on the sl slide here is uh, has been developed by uh, National Geographic magazine and is looking at sort of calling on world leaders to take this approach. So we're sort of we're we're sort of very much on mission with other countries. Um, and we, you know where are we going to get that thirty percent? Well, uh, obviously we're we're proud of our nature reserves and we do you know we've got some of the best wildlife habitats in the county, um, such as this Bodham Lake. Um, but uh, I think we cover something like 0.6% of the county, something like that. So way off 30% uh, at, at the moment. So it's never going to be something that an organisation that uh, like uh, actually that we'd be able to achieve on our own. I mean, fortunately, 
we're not on our own. Um, there are a number of other conservation bodies with land holdings in the county um, that collectively will um, add up uh, to quite a lot. And we're also lucky that we've got a lot of, sort of community green spaces and common land as well, lots of commons which are uh, managed for biodiversity. Um, and then we also have designated sites in the county. We, generally speaking, sites of special scientific interest should be you know, in good uh, good condition with uh, good habitats and, and still supporting species. We've got a network of local wildlife sites and these are going to be becoming increasingly important as time goes on. And we've got a lot of work to do around local wildlife sites in terms of resurveying and updating our knowledge on them and designating new sites. And then we've got roadside verge nature reserves. Um, and verging on wild, I guess many of you went to the uh, last uh, recent presentation by um, Verging on Wild and they, you know, they're doing a tremendous amount of good work. Um, and it's increasing habitats across the, the county. And of course, they're linear features. They, they will act as corridors as well. And then there'll be a, you know, a number of other sites um, in private ownership across the county that we, we, many of which we might not necessarily uh, know about. But all in all, it's not going to come to 30%, and I haven't got a figure that I can give you, but we should, we, we're working on that at the moment, but it's not going to be 30%, it might, might be half that. Um, so there's, you know, there's no question that we're going to have to create new habitats. And this is happening um, at the moment. We, we, do, we do some of this, and the picture on the right is us doing some um, hay meadow um, uh, creation. Uh, and you know, organisations like Herefordshire Meadows are doing a tremendous amount of this sort of work as well within the county. Uh, and then you know, there's a lot of interest in tree planting going on at the moment. Um, so you know, new habitats are going to need to be created, um, and we've got to find places for those habitats uh, to go. And of course, you know, we can do a lot within our own gardens. Wildlife gardening is going to be pretty important when you you consider the total area of um, habitat that can be achieved across gardens, you know, it's really quite collectively, really quite significant. Um, and then we've got our sort of urban wildlife corridors and habitats. Um, again, these can be an enhanced and expanded upon. Um, but there's no question that, um, you know, essentially we need to be doing a lot more um, with the, the farming community uh, and making sure that wildlife uh, is more integrated into the farmed environment. You know, 77% of our county is farmed. Um, and so, you know, this is where there are huge opportunities uh, and it's an area that we particularly want to work on. Um, and of course, you know, there's, there's, a, there's lots of good work already going on in the county. Um, we know ways that wildlife and habitats can be created within farms. And then we've got newer concepts around agroforestry and regenerative farming. Um, we haven't got much agroforestry in the county at the moment, but there's great potential with it in terms of enhancing biodiversity, um, carbon um, uh, sequestration, soil health um, and nutrient management. Um, and the same goes for regenerative farming. There's quite a lot of regenerative farming going on now in the county, uh, a lot of good ambassadors of that. So we need to be you know, encouraging that, showing the benefits of that and rolling that out as much as possible. Um, but yeah, in the farmed environment is, is you know, is, is where we need to be focusing a lot of our effort. Um, and then, you know, how, how are we going to resource this? And I, I mentioned at the start that, you know, the, through the Environment Bill, that, and there is um, a, a, a plan to resource nature recovery networks. And one of those is potentially going to be through biodiversity net gain, uh, which is should be coming online I think in 2022, so next year. Uh, at the moment we've got the the uh, uh, mitigation hierarchy when, when it comes to planning, so whenever you want to build a development you have to um, first off by trying to avoid any impacts on wildlife and, and wildlife habitats. Um, if you can't sufficiently avoid harming them you have to minimise um, the harm that you are causing and, and see what you can do to mitigate that. And then, you know, following that, the last resort really is, a, is compensation. And that includes things such as biodiversity offsetting, where you create new habitats elsewhere to make up for what has been lost. But it only um, requires no net loss. Um, what we're talking about now is biodiversity net gain. Um, 
And so this is going to you know, deliver a significant improvements for wildlife by creating or enhancing habitats in association with development. And the developers will be required to um, create a minimum of uh, a temp an extra 10% um, uh, as a result of their development. Um, we'd like to, that to be more, we'd like that to be 20%. And, and it's, I, I believe it's within local authority power to perhaps stipulate that locally. Um, so that's maybe something we could look at at the, at the county level, uh, but it will be a minimum of, of 10 percent. Um, that can be achieved on site or off site um, or through a combination. And they have this uh, this this uh, use of metrics that calculate the value of habitats being impacted. So, you'd, you know, some some habitats, sadly, you know, all habitats are hugely important, but some see some are more important than than others. Um, and so they score them using these very confusing metrics, which I still haven't really quite got my head around yet, um, so that you can assess what the impact will be and therefore what needs to be achieved um, elsewhere to uh, compensate for that. Um, and then there's also sort of like interesting concepts around habitat banks. Different parts of the country are looking at this. Um, the idea being that instead of a developer uh, deciding or working out where that um, uh, Ten percent is going to go. You know, locally partnerships can develop and and create um, big sort of habitat creation projects, um, which the developers just buy into. Effectively, you get investments, you get you get it sorted out, and then the the developers buy into it um, to help deliver it and manage it. Uh, and you know, there are I'm sure there are pros and cons to it, but you know, what they say is that that enables you know a local planned approach and a strategic approach to um, where this biodiversity net gain money is, is delivered. So it's a little bit more thought through. Uh, and the other great opportunity on the horizon is the Environmental Land Management Scheme coming in in 2024. Uh, so three tiers to this, there's a sustainable farming incentive, local nature recovery and then landscape recovery. Sustainable farming incentive is going to be looking at the individual farm holding and sort of have a suite of packages that a farmer can adopt and get payments for. So it will be a package around perhaps hedgerows and hedgerow management or a package around wetlands. Um, and they can opt in um, for any number of those, depending what's on farm um, and get payments to deliver them. The local nature recovery uh, tier enables groups of farmers to work together, to work on a larger scale um, and, and work to deliver local nature recovery strategies. Um, so working on some of those local priorities. And then you've got landscape recovery, which um, is even bigger scale. Again, you're looking at two to 3,000 hectares in size, and you're looking at you know, ecosystem, uh, you know, restoration of, of ecosystem services. So it might be peatland restoration or big um, landscape scale projects like that. Um, and all tiers have to deliver public goods. And they've identified six public goods, um, which are, are listed there. You can see that thriving plants and wildlife is part of that. Um, but again, they are all interplay with each other. Um, and there are a number of trials going on around the country at the moment, um, looking at different ways that the ELMS schemes might be implemented. And we're actually part of one of those trials. We, we're going to be and um, redesigning farm plans to take better account of these six uh, public goods. Um, nature recovery networks um, can also be used to inform uh, landscape scale projects as well. So uh, help us um, provide evidence of need, um, priorities for action, where, where we're doing what, because I would still see there'll be a role going forward for um, partnerships coming together to deliver within specific areas of the county. And of course, you know, it can help direct private investment as well. You know, lots of companies want to offset their carbon footprint and want to plant trees um, and, you know, and looking for ways to do that. And as I say, we, you know, we want this to be done in a sensible fashion, trees going in where they should be going in, but also promoting other the benefits of other habitats, because again, um, peat is hugely important. Um, peat restoration is hugely important for carbon storage, as are meadows as well. Um, so, you know, making sure that, um, you know, th those are recognised as well as, uh, as 
um, as woodlands. Um, oh yeah, I just yeah, I, I put this one as a, I didn't know where to put this in the presentation. <laughs> to be honest with you, so I, I just stuck it in anywhere in the end. But I, I thought the other thing that um, needs to be just mentioned is, although sort of generally speaking, the habitats and species for the county, the priority ones, uh, remain the same. There has been a big shift uh, in, in focus on the reintroduction of lost species, and particularly keystone species that can um, uh, have an impact on the wider environment. And in the last you know year or so, we've seen. The return of pine martins to Herefordshire, which is fantastic. Um, you know, they are a keystone species because they, you know, they can um, have impact on things such as grey squirrel. There's, there's you know, great hopes that their return will um, enable displacement of grey squirrel and reduction in their numbers, and that obviously is going to be helpful to the health of our woodlands. Um, and then beavers, of course, a lot of talk about beavers at the moment and the benefits that they can bring. They are an ecosystem engineer, so they will change the environment around them um, and there are all sorts of benefits as natural flood management um, uh, and, and cleaning of water and you know trapping sediments and all sorts of things so there's opportunities there to um, take advantage of that uh, and, and you know and, and you know again integrating biodiversity with natural cover so really i'm sort of like coming around to my uh, summary now so um these are some of the next steps i think that we are, are, are crucial. They aren't the only ones um, uh, within the county. I think we need to be adopting 3030 within Herefordshire as our target. We, you know, we have our climate and ecological emergency. At the moment, the climate aspect has, you know, has a target of zero carbon by 2030. Um, I don't think we formally adopted 3030 as the um, target for recovering biodiversity, and that, you know, I think that um, that's something we need to adopt. Um, we need to be working now with partners to develop our local nature recovery strategy. Obviously, we're starting to work on the actual mapping side of things, but the local nature recovery strategy is much more than that. Um, and we need to sort of bring in all the partners and start having those discussions now. I don't think we should be waiting for the environment bill to come out and start dictating when, you know, it, uh, you know that, that could be quite a way down the line. And I think we need to be ready um, sooner. Um, as I mentioned before, we really need to update our system on our local wildlife sites uh, and get a better understanding on the quality of those and increasing our understanding of habitats in the county more generally um, to feed into this process of nature recovery, you know, of informing our nature recovery networks. Um, want to ensure that biodiversity plays a key role in deliver, de delivering natural processes. I've talked about that. Um, I've talked about elms and biodiversity net gain and you know, those are on the horizon and we need to be ready for those when they arrive. Um, and I think most of us know that um, we do have issues around our, the quality of our rivers and streams and, and that um, that is something that we need to be working on uh, in tandem. Uh, and, you know, individually, we can all contribute to this. Um, we're taking what's called a team wilder approach now. Um, you'll be hearing a lot more about that in the future, I'm sure. Um, but really, as I've pointed out, if we want to get to 3030, you know, the, the Wildlife Trust and the conservation bodies alone aren't going to be able to achieve that. We need everyone, communities, landowners and, and us as individuals as well. So there's some examples there of um, how you can uh, get involved um, and um, uh, help support this action. And I thought, you know, I, I've got to end asking for something. So um, we are actually trying to acquire a new meadow. Um, we have a, an appeal on at the moment and uh, it fits all of these, um, all of what we've been talking or I've been talking about this evening. Uh, it's connectivity in the landscape. Uh, it's near one of our existing uh, nature reserves and um, next to existing biodiversity rich sites. And there's great potential to enhance it as well. So um, if you're able to support us with that, that would be fantastic. And that's it. I think I'll, I'll stop sharing. Well, thank you very much, Andrew. Um, it was wonderful. And um, we have some questions. So I think, um, Nick, I think you were going to start out with uh, the first question. And yeah. yeah, sure. Um, we've, th there's not any particular theme, uh, um, themes emerging under which to group them. So probably take them one at a time. 
Um, I know um, there's been some interventions from some of our wildlife team to answer some of them, but there's, they're all very good questions. Um, there's a good one here from uh, about half an hour ago um, from Jill um, about um, species and where they go. Uh, would Jill like to unmute and ask that question from 747 if she can scroll back and find it? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. I would start my video, but I'm in my dressing gown and I look a bit of a state, so I'll uh, <laughs> I'll keep my video off. Yeah, I was just wondering when you know you talked about the species sort of traveling and going off. How do they know which which way to travel, and how do they know you know that they're going to actually get somewhere? Do they sort of go out on uh, sort of foraging missions and come back, or just kind of how does that work? Oh, well, yeah, it's a good question. It, it, um, it depends very much on the species. Obviously, some species will, you know, will be quite happy traveling quite long distances. Um, uh, and, you know, looking out for habitat as they go. I mean, they don't, you know, to be honest with you, when, when, a, when a species sets out from a habitat, it doesn't know whether it's going to um, uh, reach other good habitat. Um, and so, you know, if it isn't there, if it isn't there for it, um, it will either return um, or, it, you know, it could perish in, if, if the, the habitat that it's moving into isn't suitable for it, or, you know, it might, it might become a victim of, um, you know, whatever land uses uh, occur there. So um, it really does, you know, that's why, you know, this, it, that connectivity needs to be consistent effectively. So as species leave their habitats to forage and find other sites, um, you know, that, there is continuity there for them to reach other safe havens. Mm. Okay, thank you. Thank, thanks, Sandra. Um, can we go on to another one that's come up? Uh, yeah, I think um, you were going to do it, Wendy. You were going to. I'm thinking of Lucy Fay's question, okay. 73. Is Lucy there? Can you unmute and ask your question? And I've got a very noisy toddler in the background, sorry. Um, my question was about whether um, the Nature Recovery Network takes account of how difficult some habitats are to restore or create and whether there's um, perhaps a risk of um, there being an abundance or a focus on creating the sort of easier habitats and not the more difficult ones even though they're probably the ones that are in most need. Mm. Do you know what? Yeah. No, um, it doesn't. Um, it doesn't take that into consideration. And that's a good question, actually. And, uh, you know, it, it does flag up, you know, the need. And, and I think that's something that's something we probably have to address through the local nature recovery strategy. And, you know, it's not just about the map, but there is, you know, there is strategy to go along with it. And I think you know, we, we're going to want to have some kind of targets there for the individual habitats, the level of habitats. In fact, you know, in Gloucestershire, they have done some of that work as well. Um, so, yes, I mean, you, we, we were going to want to set limits and say, actually, um, you know, we, we need to focus on some of these more difficult ones to create, um, you know, and, and perhaps you know, stop doing the other ones that, you know, that, that are more straightforward. Um, yeah, it's a, it, it is, it's a good point. And at the moment, the actual mapping process, I don't think takes that into account. Hmm. We have another question. It's from Barbara Ferris. It's the next one. Um, Barbara, do you want to unmute and ask this question? Well, uh, I uh, was very excited uh, to have this wonderful presentation and also to see the uh, mapping of the ice ponds recently, which is tremendous work going on locally. And I know that uh, were it not for COVID, there would be uh, um, an exciting map suggesting an area to put in for a bid uh, that Jesse Norman thought could, if the if there was sufficient coordination within the county, 
um, to go before Parliament this year for a national park. Uh, I wondered, uh, and part of that would be about establishing a good area of connectivity and um, um, uh, and I, I wondered how much you were involved with this and uh, how it, all these exciting projects could link together and impress more because of the vast amount of riches we have. Mm. Um, we've not been uh, formally involved in those discussions around a national park. And there's been numerous discussions around protected landscapes, increasing the protected landscapes in Herefordshire for quite some time. And there's, you know, there were, um, I think it was the Hobson report back in the 1940s, early 50s, which first looked at all the potential AOMBs and national parks across the country. And Herefordshire didn't get all of the ones that it should have got. Um, uh, the Golden Valley, for example, was uh, a, a contender early on um, and up in the northwest of the county as well uh, were sites that were potentially designated. Now, there are there are benefits to protected landscapes. They do come with resources. Um, and, you know, say just for example, I know that the protected landscapes, the AOMBs and national parks in England are likely to get their own environmental land management scheme to support them as an enhanced layer. Um, on, on top of, of what the rest of the countryside is getting. Um, so, you know, they, they can help um, create more activity and more conservation effort. And that's not to say that there aren't, you know, uh, practices within protected landscapes that, you know, aren't good for wildlife. You know, we're still getting some, you know, um, very intensive land management in some of those sites. So they're not always great for, for biodiversity, but they, you know, they, they certainly have the resources and they have teams that can um, help enhance that. So, you know, there is the potential there to uh, tie this in and provide greater evidence um, towards a designation. The one thing I would say though, is I, I, I worked for a protected landscape for an AOMB for a, a long time, and they take a tremendous amount of time to designate. Uh, years and years and years and you know there is already quite a long waiting list of sites around the country uh, to be assessed. Um, so whilst I think yes it would be great to have more protected landscape and designated landscapes in our county we really must not um, actually sort of like uh, uh, continue with progressing in every way that we can alongside that, that um, process. Mm. Um, so I don't know, does that answer your question, Barbara? I think so, thank you. I was going to suggest, um, thank you Andrew and Barbara. Um, Celia Candell has got an interesting um, comment um, in relation to the 30 by 30. I think she's got a suggestion on another contribution towards that 30%. Celia, can you speak yeah. to a question please? Yeah, um, I was just wondering to what extent you're coordinating with Caring for God's Acre, our churchyard here in Cusock, we've been working with them for 15 years. And also a lot of churches are now um, working towards Eco Church Awards, including the land management um, area. So there's a huge resource of biodiversity in churchyards, I think. Mm. Yeah, no, I agree. Absolutely. Yeah, that's one that should be on the list. Um, yeah, some fantastic churchyards around the county. Um, uh, Caring for God's Acre, you know, we we have worked with them in the past. We have, I wouldn't say we've worked with them as much just recently, but we have sort of a long standing relationship with them. I mean, they've been operating for 20 odd years themselves now, haven't they? And they, they originated in Shropshire just over the, over the border. Um, and so, yeah, I, absolutely. I think, you know, there will be um, additional um, good biodiversity sites in, in many instances. Right, thank you. We have another question here from Richard, who is um, coming at the 30 by 30 um, targ uh, campaign from a totally different area, which is the oceans. And he has a question about software for you, Andrew. Richard, I think you're um, 
also called Anastasia Calder. Can you tell? Uh, sorry, Richard has just just disappeared for a minute. <laughs> Come back. Here he is. Here he is. I was going to say, do you want to read his question? Sorry, Anne. Here he is. Yeah, no, no, here's my question. Here's my question. So thanks very much for that, Andrew. I don't often pay much attention to, to the land. So I've been, I sort of helped, I think, one of the architects of 30 by 30, which came out of the ocean realm. And I've been looking at uh, designing and implementing and politically pushing uh, marine protected area networks, uh, so in the seas and oceans around the world for the ooh, 16 years now. Uh, and, and my question is, is looking at that map of, of Herefordshire with all those different layers of different habitats uh, and um, you kind of look at it and go, well, what, what, what would be the most strategic area to make, you know, will bring us the most benefits? And I'd be bamboozled. Are you using any kind of software to help you make choices yeah. in, in terms in terms of you know the uh you know public um or the the presentation of those maps they will be more uh user friendly um i think what's important is when we have these we, we've often had these discussions and debates about prioritizing areas for um, for some of this activity and you say well actually let's focus in on this these zones here and there and, and you know try and rationale uh, for some of this but you know I and I, and I think the accepted uh, approach is that we really don't want to do that we, what we want is something that is county-wide effectively and you want to be able to say that in the different parts of the county you should be doing this or you, you know you should be doing that or it could be a combination of, of things so so that every land holding effectively has suggestions and opportunities associated with it. Because I've worked on projects in the past whereby they have their boundaries and you've tried to prioritize and then you have someone who wants to do some fantastic work but is outside of your area. So you end up working with them anyway uh, and they you know, help them do it because it's a good piece of work. And, uh, and then you start wondering why you've got these, these boundaries in the, in the first place. Um, uh, and so it's, you know, we, we feel it's very important to have so that every, um, and especially at the moment, whilst we don't have fantastic data sets for the county, we're trying to improve those. Um, we really don't know what's going to be, what's the, what the habitats are going to be in certain parts of the county, what the opportunities are effectively. And so, you know, we want to make sure that the whole county is covered. And, you know, once we're out in those sites, we can see for ourselves, you know, what, you know, what the opportunities really are. So I don't know, did that, did that answer your question? Well, I kind of knew the answer really. And I, I think it's basically got to sort of go for what you can, where you can, you know, uh, and based on your, 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 your best judgment at, uh, at the time. And certainly there is an argument, and I think this is the rewilding re thing as it comes through. It, it, in the ocean, that's much more obvious. If you just leave somewhere, things happen and quite often completely unexpected things happen from the earliest marine reserves places that we thought were dominated by sort of sea urchins suddenly become kelp forests and the species change uh, c completely. And I think, you know, it comes back to the, this idea of give it, um, you know, letting nature d do its thing is quite an important, important thing and unexpected things will happen, but mm. uh, they'll probably be, be beneficial. And I, 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 I I do think we've, you know, we live on a, an island farm, don't we? And it, and and it, but we need we we need more wild places, and I think we need to let nature do its its thing in a lot more places. Yeah, and I think there there is a role for that, and you know, I I am denied about including some information about um, uh, a, a concept called wild belt, which the Wildlife Trust are looking at at the moment, and that's looking at a new designation. A new land designation that will be primarily for just that effectively you know supporting uh, regeneration and, and natural processes um, uh, but at the moment it's still in its infancy really um, and I you know we're going we're going to see that anyway I think there's a lot of interest in sort of rewilding and they're talking about pop-up rewilding initiatives um, and you know on sort of mini neps and and things like that so I I think that's certainly going to be part 
of the picture um, going forward. But you know, the, la the situation on land is, is very different, as you know, to, to in the sea. It's, it's all owned for one thing, and it's a very fragmented ownership. Um, uh, uh, and, and so, you know, we, we, we're working with a completely different set of rules, effectively, when we're, when we're talking about nature recovery on land. And I think particularly in, in Herefordshire, because we've got so much good agricultural soil in the county that it's, there's always going to be a pressure for production here. Um, and so we're going to be looking at, in many instances, how do we integrate wildlife alongside that? Um, and in some parts of the county, we, we can look at perhaps larger sort of areas of um, rewilding approaches. Um, you know, and certainly we're looking at some of the opportunities around that at the moment, but it's, you know, we, it is, you know, it is a sort of a very more um, difficult situation, I would have said that, you know, not a more, it's, it's a different set of circumstances in terms of our approach on, on land. Yeah, I mean, I don't think we really have any wilderness in, in, in this country, except for the offshore stuff, probably west of Shetland. Yeah. yeah. No, not, not true wilderness. Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, that's, it's not necessarily about having a, you know, a true wilderness in a, in a country like ours. It's making, it's just, it's a, it's a journey, isn't it? We're all, we all want to move to a more, a wilder situation than where we are now, effectively. And rewilding is not just obviously about, um, abandonment and letting nature completely do its own thing it's a, you know it's a, it's a process and um, a lot of rewilding projects are about integrating you know still using grazing animals to influence the outcomes and things like that so that they do it at net um, and so the, you know there's a lot of scope for that sort of thing can i um suggest wendy can you can you do the 757 question please can you see it Yep, that's what I was going to do. That's great. Great. Brilliant. Thank Fantastic. Yeah, so, um, yeah, it's been a really interesting question. Obviously, thank you, Andrew. It's been really interesting and it's really great to have an insight into the complexities and the level of partnership working is going to have to be, obviously, to, to, to move this forward. Um, and it's a really good question from somebody who's, who's, who's got some... Um, um, some information that to pass on and where that goes to is Rachel. Um, question... Um, from 757. Is Rachel there? No, it's all very quiet. Um, just give Rachel a second to unmute herself. No, I'll ask her the question anyway. Maybe Rachel, if she, um, she can manage to, uh, if she's still here, wants to come back. Um, she says she's part of a charity that owns 24 acres of land, including Swales. Would it be helpful to pass this information on to someone? So I guess it underlines the mechanics of how it's going to work. In yes. Yeah. Together. There's a few processes by which, you know, we, we, we're working on that. It's how, how can people feed into this uh, system? Because there's going to be a lot of farmers that are, that are interested in uh, getting their uh, land, you know, information about their land on these maps, we think, because of course, it could be influencing payments further down the line. And so we're looking at different ways of doing that. We're looking at the criteria that, say, Gloucestershire Wildlife Trust need for, for information to be drawn into nature recovery networks. But one good way of doing it um, is actually getting it onto the, the uh, national priority habitat inventories. And there is a process to doing that. There are, you know, you, you do have to do surveys, you have to present the maps, and they can then be sort of verified and adopted onto that national habitat inventory map. Um, and then that will be drawn into the process because we'll be, you know, this will be reviewing these maps probably on an annual basis but that's to be determined. And then any new data that goes onto those presses, uh, process will be drawn into the system effectively. So that's, that's one good uh, way of doing it. Um, local biological record centres are always interested in uh, information and we've um, uh, acquired it in, uh, data from them in terms of producing this mapping work as well. So there are there are multiple routes really, um, but we are still working on the, the process of, of how we, we bring that together. There's a question which is about net, but I think you may have already answered that. Um, 
Andrew, would uh, is Suzanne happy for that one to be um, to us? Uh, do you feel like it's been answered already? Yeah, yeah, that was pretty much answered. Thanks. Um, okay. I, it was just the, it was also the point that that NEP has has managed to produce by accident this kind of dynamic wood pasture, which is a habitat which doesn't fit into any of the criteria that you're talking about for habitats. Mm. Yes. Um, uh, I don't know how to answer that, Suzanne, really. <laughs> I've been to NEP and it's fantastic. And yes, yeah, you're right. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not entirely sure. I mean, I would, I would, I mean, I've not been there for a few years, but I, um, it, it, you're right. It doesn't really fit into sort of some of the categories. Of course, some of it does. They have woodlands, they have wetlands, they have scrub there, don't they? They've got, you know, they do have a mixture of these. Um, and as you say, it's almost a little bit like wood pasture um, in places. Um, so, you know, it might be that, you know, if, you know, if we ended up through rewilding section uh, areas of the county, we ended up with um, uh, new habitats that we needed to uh, incorporate into our list of habitats for the county, then, um, then that might be the case. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it, it, you know, the, the, NEP, the NEP example is an interesting one, isn't it? And it's, we're still learning a lot from it. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, thanks all. Um, we are still getting questions added and we have been going for an hour and a half. Um, a so I'm not sure whether we will be able to accommodate all of the questions that are still being added, but um, we'll, we'll, we'll keep going. There's an, there's an observation um, from Tony Fagan. I don't know if Tony wants to um, make that observation herself. Was that that it's too late? Elms is too late? Yes, 2024. 2024, I just wonder if there's actually going to be anything left by then. I just feel it's it's too late. We need to start working on this right now. That's that's it, basically. I mean, it's yeah. grim. It looks grim out there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, we do, you know, work is starting on this. And I, you know, yes, we're going to have more losses in the... I think in the near term, um, uh, and you know there are other mechanisms we can still be utilising in the in the meantime. There are still you know countryside stewardship and other sort of uh, 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 agri environment schemes that we can utilise to support activity where we are at the moment. I'd say probably the bigger threats, though, really, um, uh, it's not so much about the the need for new schemes to come into place, I'd say it's probably more um, the, the, the threat from harm that, that's unregulated, you know, to you, uh, support for our regulatory bodies at this stage um, to protect what we have. Uh, and I, you know, I think that that needs to be um, more robust um, at this stage to um, safeguard our habitats until some such time as the, you know, the new schemes come into place. Yeah. 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 Can I can I just re respond to that? So just you know that is uh, Herefordshire councillors have have appealed to our MPs and ministers to say actually we really really need the help for for our agencies. It's it's absolutely crucial, and I think the more people that give that message to government, just to actually we you know we really really need help i think it's crucial mm. that we do and that that um also that councillors will sort of th there there are many of us that want to push the support that the county can give organizations like yourselves to actually be able to deliver on nature recovery networks um you know we're going to push for that so mm. we're just well, it's yeah fantastic to have your support for that Tony, that's great and yes I, yeah, I agree and that's part of our individual actions that we can take is you know write to our MPs and you know and lobby um, for, for you know greater powers and better resources for our regulatory bodies and we know we, we, we've, we've had examples where you know damage is being done to the environment and they haven't been able to step in um, because they don't have the resources. It happens quite often I would say. Anne, do you want to do the 8.14 question? Yeah, um, we have um, 
What about, um, this is a question from Roslyn to um, Andrew. It's um, concerning phosphates, the well-known problem of phosphate. <laughs> Roslyn. Yeah, hello. Yes, it's um, really pertinent to what's just been said. I mean, there's a lot of interest in good work, but at the very same time, we're giving all these poultry units, intensive poultry units, planning permission. And it seems to me inevitable that that's going to increase the phosphate in the water. And that's connectivity, you know, it's all going past all these reserves and we don't seem to have adequate control over it. It just seems very frustrating. Yeah, I, I, I mean, it's, it's, you know, I agree with that. That's a statement, really, is it, Rosa? And, you know, we, we've seen... Well, you know, what can we do? Well, you know, I, there is, in, in, I, I think there is obviously increasing pressure now to, to, to stop development of these sites. Um, they are still, though, still occasionally getting permission. Um, yeah, that's the uh, problem. It's still happening. And, and it, I think, you know, it's, and, and it's not just poultry units. Um, you know, a lot of phosphate gets into the water through other means. 25% is still obviously from sewage treatment uh, works. Um, but also, you know, how we manage the floodplain is a key component of this. Uh, you know, it's so much of it is ploughed up um, for arable land and we're getting increasing numbers of flood events, which is causing, you know, um, uh, sediments and soils to be washed into the river. Um, and so, you know, we need to be looking at how we're managing that landscape as well as the poultry units. But you're right, I, you know, the, those recent um, calculations, you know, the, I think in the, in the catchments as a whole, there's 2,000 more kilos of phosphate going on the ground every year than the, the plants can take up. So, uh, you know, that that is going to, a lot of that's going to end up in our, our rivers. And, and apparently, even if we stop applying phosphates to our land tomorrow, there's a legacy there that's going to last for years and years. And it's going to, um, you know, it means that our, our rivers are going to be polluted um, and breaching those thresholds for many years to come. Um, so, you know, it is a big problem and, you know, we are, you know, we, we've been working hard and fighting hard uh, to, to sort of try and uh, you know, change this situation along with many other uh, conservation uh, organisations. Um, so, you know, we're all doing what we can effectively. Um, but it's, you know, it, it needs sort of that top level change in, in attitude uh, to, you know, to, to a lot of these developments, basically. It just seems so difficult once they've granted permission. That's it, isn't it? Can they take the permission away? No, not unless they're challenged they for judicial review, potentially. That's the problem at the same time. You know, if we could just stop the gravy drain. <laughs> you know, and I, I th you know, this is, you know, and this will be part of the, you know, the solution as well. We're talking about natural capital alongside nature recovery networks. And, you know, that we, again, I know Elms is still a couple of years off before it, it comes into play. Uh, but, you know, there should be more funding resources to support change uh, in this respect. Um, and there is a lot of good work going on in the county in terms of regenerative farming on floodplains. And so yeah. there are those good examples. And we really need to be sort of making more of those and, um, you know, working with farmers. Because a, a lot of farmers you know, do, do want to change and, and um, uh, you know, are, are keen to, to in, improve on some of their systems. Um, but, you know, there's a, there's a support need and guidance need, you know, to, to help them through that process. Can I quickly interject just to move things on past a couple of questions? There's some, um, uh, I'll ask the two people concerned whether they want to add more, but um, there is a comment, Tony Fagan, what are the largest obstacles to um, an RN success in Herefordshire? And Helen Stace has um, in, responded straight after that, which I think is a response. Too much of the land is in unsympathetic ownership. Which I think relates partly to what Andrew was just talking about, and um, and Rosalind as well. Um, do either Tony or Helen want to add to that exchange at this point? Um, I I don't actually at the moment. I mean, I 
want to know what the biggest obstacles are and then you know then we need to know what we're targeting thanks I, you know, and I'd, yeah, I'd agree with Helen, and I'd add, um, you know, obviously resources as well. I mean, as I said, we we see working um, with the landowning community is 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 key to restoring wildlife. Um, you know, and we you know we'd like to expand our team, and you know, and and get you know get that engagement going on a much bigger scale. Um, and that's you know that's not just for us, but um, you know, many other conservation bodies. Uh, in the county, I'm sure would say the same. Um, the next one. Um, um, do you want to pick up the 818 one? I am. I am. Great. Um, it's just a question from Sheila Wren again. Um, do you, um, which is around the uh, commitment of the county council. Um, do you want to, Sheila? Do you want to come in there? Uh, only very quickly to say. Um, I know what a long hard road it has been to get this on the national agenda and, and now it's um, the uh, the job of the local authorities to, to pick up the baton and, and I was just really wanting a flavour for how far up the agenda you feel it is and uh, if there's anything that we can do either as individuals or uh, parish councils or, or other bodies to, to help with that that process some of some of that's been answered and thank you for, for responding comments in chat but if there's any sort of general view i'd be interested thank you is this in, specifically with regards to nature recovery networks uh you're thinking Sheila? uh for the, the whole of the Does the whole of the way? sort of sorry yeah we we you know we i'd say engagement with herefordshire council has increased significantly over the last uh two years or so you know through the Climate and Ecological Emergency Group. We're also, you know, working with the council in terms of the issues around um, phosphates. Um, uh, we've also been talking to them quite a bit about uh, the local wildlife sites criteria and new designations and data. Um, so, that, you know, we're, we're, we're engaging with them on a number of fronts now. When it comes to nature recovery networks, um, we've, we've obviously discussed this with them. Um, they are supportive of our activity. Um, they, they, um, I think they, they're keen to see how the Environment Bill rolls through um, before they get too engaged in local nature recovery strategies. And obviously, mm -hmm. you know, I, you know I, this is a bit of speculation on my part, but of course, you know, they, they, they haven't, they, there hasn't been an any sort of instruction as yet as to who, we think it would be the, the council, but there hasn't, that hasn't formally been um, said okay. that they will be responsible for De developing these um uh but i would say on the on the whole uh, we we've got a positive relationship with the local authority and they um they you know the amount of engagement we've had has increased substantially thank you that's really helpful thank you i appreciate it. it's a developing time wendy do you want to take the next one Wendy, Wendy, you're muted. I, I would suggest you might bring your question forward because I think it's a very good one, the one you've suggested to me. Um, okay, I've got to go back and find it now because there's a couple of questions ago. I'll find it. Hang on. <laughs> In the meantime, just take Mo's question. Okay, so so there's a really interesting question about county borders, I think, um, um, which... Um, was answered a bit a little bit earlier on but it is about, about joining things up um mo would you like to come in with your question no is mo there yeah yeah, yeah. <sighs> sorry <laughs> got it oh sorry getting the late late in the day for technology um well really the question is as I wrote it, I'm just uh, I'm just interested in um, uh, Andrew. At the very beginning of your talk, you said that um, the um, NRNs are going to be rolled out sort of you know sort of regionally and, and all the rest of it. Um, but particularly important in um, in the in the sense that partnership working across you know between local authorities and other agencies be, be, between you know landscapes and land masses and all the rest of it. 
So I'm just wondering how much weight that that's been given us. But, you know, when you look at sort of like transport systems and network rail and verges and all that sort of stuff, as well as, you know, mountains and rivers and, and all the rest of water courses, how much weight is that, is that being given, um, do you think, um, you know, in the scheme of things, in terms of the overall strategy? Yeah, in terms of nature recovery networks and local nature recovery strategy. Um, I'd say that at the moment, I'm not aware that there is any requirement for cross-border consideration at, but, you know, by the counties involved. However, there is a requirement that the approach is um, through a consistent methodology. In fact, they've, you know, they've quite recently said that where activity is happening um, uh, on a local level, as in organically, such as the work that we're doing at the mapping uh, at the moment, that that will form the evidence base uh, of the nature recovery network once they've decided what the, you know, the final methodologies um, and the protocol is for developing these. So there'll be these, you know, this, this will come with a set of instructions, if you like, as to how it should be done. Um, and that, uh, the, the only reason, the main reason I can see for doing that is to ensure that there, there will be consistency between counties, whether that will actually transpire or not, I don't know. So, um, so I see that that's the way that they are looking to um, achieve that. <clears throat> Nick, may I interrupt for a second? Follow me, follow me, yes, yes. I, I, it's just that I'm noticing, Nick, that uh, about a third of the participants tonight have, are disappearing. And as chair of the Wildlife Trust, I just wanted to, before everybody goes, to say thank you very much to Andrew for giving up his evening to us this evening. Uh, for Helen for sitting with us as well. She's had a long day as well. Wendy as well. And of course, to the city branch for organising this evening and making it all happen. Well, I think as some people already know, at least one of your events like this has raised about £290 for the Trust, which is very, very good. Um, I also want to say that having listened to all that's going on, I think the people here, if they're not already aware, should be aware that every year HWT, Hereford Wildlife Trust, is working on a deficit budget. We start off the year knowing we've got to finish up with less resources than we started. We have to work very hard try to recover that and to stay uh, a viable organisation. So um, just want to make that point that these people are working extremely hard, trying to manage very tight budgets and getting us through very difficult situations. So on behalf of the Trust as a whole, thank you all very much for delivering tonight and for partaking tonight. So thank you very much for the opportunity to say that. Thank you. <laughs>